<laughs> okay. Um, you want to talk about Turkey. It's a country that I have, um, oh, my God, I'm 66 years old and been traveling back and forth since I'm 18, spent a lot of years lost in the country, eventually ended up as the Turkish desk officer at the Pentagon. And I, I, I think that culturally I have some knowledge of who these people are. Now, why does this matter? Uh, the Erdogan has, really has never lied to us. He's always been exactly who he is. And if we would choose to listen to him, he told us before he was even prime minister when he was mayor of Istanbul, exactly what he wanted to do, which was to re-Islamify Turkish politics. Islam is not a religion. It's a civilization. It includes religion. And he, he, when I say he hasn't lied to us, we have chose, chosen not to listen to what he's been saying. He hasn't done anything, in, from my understanding, um, uh, uh, which would make me want to change my mind on this. We, uh, in, in when he became prime minister, the American ambassador at the time, Eric Edelman, knew exactly who he was and wrote marvelous cables to that effect. They're now out on WikiLeaks, so you can see for yourself. But the American establishment, oh, my God, we have to be nice to Turkey. We have to be nice to Erdogan. And even though he was destroying secularism, destroying democracy, and destroying the American-Turkish relationship, our, 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 our government, and this is even before President Obama, um, chose to ignore that. And imagine that if you are sick but choose to ignore that sickness, and by the time you're really hurting, you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you know, if you'd come to me a year earlier, I think I could have done something about it. But I think, sadly, it's too late. That's America. That's the way the American government works. That's basically the way the State Department works. There were a lot of people at the Pentagon who, who understood things that way as well. And as the great Bernard Lewis uh, says, who, God willing, will be uh, 100 in a few weeks, 100 years old. Um, the moment that anything goes wrong, um, that the, the Turks, the Arabs, the Iranians, whatever, accuse us of anything, instead of asking ourselves whether it's true, we say, oh, my God, what did we do wrong? What, we, what can we do to put it right? And that is why we are so unbelievably unsuccessful in most of our policies in the Middle East. Now, I could go on, but I understand you, have, you guys have all sorts of questions, and I'd be happy to answer whatever you'd like. Harold, if you would like to talk about the demographics a bit sure. in Turkey and what led to the rise of Erdogan, and if you could um, also just describe for us um, Turkey's relationship with the European Union um, and um, what has been happening recently in terms of the immigration crisis in Europe. Turkey, the, the founder of modern Turkey, uh, Kemal Atatürk, tried, this is the 1920s, tried to create a Western identity for, for that country. And that is loyalty to a land and not to a people. Loyalty beforehand was to Islam and then to all sorts of subgroups, your family, your tribe, your, your, your community. Now, uh, that was very nice, and he created this uh, identity called Turkishness. Now, by using that name, probably at least half the people of Turkey at the time were not ethnic Turks. The largest non-Turkish group were the Kurds. Now, if we bring this up to today, the, even Erdogan himself, the, prime minister, or the president now, um, says that by 2038, Kurds are having a lot more children in Turkey than are Turks. And he says that the demography will be 50-50. That is 50% Turks, 50% Kurds in 2038. But the Turkish Interior Ministry knows today that it's already there, that we are about 50-50. Now, what is the definition of a Kurd, and what is the definition of a Turk, ethnically? It isn't what I say. It's what they say. If a person feels he's a Kurd but doesn't speak any Kurdish because his father's father's whatever was a Kurd, then he identifies that way, and that's who he is. I know many people in Turkey who don't know a word of Kurdish, or they can say like three or four words, 
but their father was a Kurd, their grandfather was the Kurd. And they're totally intermarried with Turks, but if your father was a Kurd, you're a Kurd. And so we are already in a situation right now where it's exploding. Why does it matter today? Erdogan wants to be dictator, sultan, not only of Turkey, but of the entire Muslim world. He wants to restore uh, the position of Turkey uh, to being the, the, the head of the caliph. He wants to be the caliph, the Muslim leader of the entire Muslim world, and eventually the whole world. Now, if we uh, look at what he did at first, in order to give himself the constitutional powers that would allow him to do what he wanted, he needed a two-thirds or three-quarters majority, I don't remember, but what matters is that he at first made an alliance with the Kurds. We're all Muslims, we're all brothers, and he figured that would help. Well, it failed. So he was, in the beginning, very actually pro-bringing Kurds into the system. But when he saw it failed, he went for another option. There are the extreme Turkish nationalists who were not supporters of his. And, and he went to them and said, look, let's work together. We'll get the Kurds. We'll destroy them. And you'll vote for me. I'll become the sultan. And we'll go for the Turkish aspect here. And that's why in the last year or so, he has been absolutely terrible to the Kurds. And he is He's responsible for the deaths of so many of them, of bombings all over the place, uh, and uh, it, it's terrible. Now, what about Europe here? The, in Islam, and before anything, Erdogan considers himself a Muslim. The goal of Islam, and this is all sorts of classic Islamic texts prove this, is that the, into the entire world has to become Muslim. Now, there are two ways of doing that. One is conquering it by military conquest. The Turks aren't the best at those things today, so that's out of the question. So what do you do? You try to get all sorts of Muslims into Europe, because there's, that's the weakest part of the Western world, and they're the ones who have more children, and eventually they will take over Europe, and Europe will finally become part of the Muslim world. All these agreements that Erdogan has been making with the Europeans are basically jokes. And uh, um, Angela Merkel, and I've always been a fan of hers till the last year in all this, has basically caved. Erdogan, she says, is our savior. Erdogan, um, uh, by these agreements. The difference is in the Middle East, when you sign an agreement, signing means nothing in the Middle East. Bygones are never bygones. There is no such thing as a peace treaty. The only time you can have peace is under Islam. And uh, other, all other agreements, according to Islamic law, are temporary in nature. So whatever agreement Erdogan signed with Mrs. Merkel, she may be very happy, but it's just another way to get massive numbers of Turkish Muslims into Europe and bring the day closer that Europe will be part of the world of Islam. I, I know that there was a recent um, um, kerfuffle between Germany and Turkey because of um, some um, comedy routine, and I know that in Germany, uh -huh. satire is very, very important. Um, are you aware of this, and would you like to describe how Angela sure. Merkel decided to react to this? She caved. Here's the thing. In the Middle East, it is better to die than be humiliated. And uh, 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 th that is why, for example, Yasser Arafat could never sign a final peace agreement, giving what we call Israel, but they know is part of the world of Islam, therefore it's Muslim forever. Uh, he could never sign an agreement. That's why Abu Mazen, the Mahmoud Abbas, who's head of the Palestinian Authority, he can and will never sign an agreement because he will be humiliated. And that, again, it's the worst thing. Now, for Erdogan to be humiliated as a good Muslim uh, from this culture of that part of the world is unacceptable. And th here you have in Germany, which to the best of my knowledge is a free country where people can say whatever they want. They can certainly say whatever they want about Angela Merkel. But she has caved, and a person who did a comedy routine, a, sa a satire on Erdogan, 
is now going to be held uh, 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 is taken to German court because he has insulted a foreign leader. This is Turkish culture imposing itself, Muslim culture, on Europe. And the response is, oh, oh, what else can I do? It is very similar to, to uh, what else can I do to make you happy? It's very similar what President Obama has done with Iran, if you notice. We hold agreements sacrosanct, but the Iranians clearly don't. Again, in the Middle East, written agreements mean nothing. So whatever agreement Obama has with Erdogan, excuse me, with the Iranians, they keep violating and they keep pushing it more. So Merkel thinks that she's got this great agreement with Erdogan on Turkey, but he keeps pushing it further and further. The goal is to slowly but surely, patiently, erode the confidence that the Europeans have in themselves and hasten the day that Muslim that, that Europe becomes Muslim. Well, I, I I don't really know even how to how to approach the question. The question is has late has NATO frankly outlived its usefulness. Uh, I'm not a specialist on European and the Atlantic Alliance, but uh, if the standards of the NATO alliance are democracy and freedom and that people are able to say what they want and not be hauled off to jail or to court because of it, then Turkey does not meet those standards. There is no rule of law in Turkey today. Whatever is on the books, people are arrested for whatever, for if, if Erdogan and company deem it in their interest to do so. This is not uh, the way uh, Western world supposedly, you know, uh, does things. Uh, but then again, remember, Angela Merkel has just caved to the Turkish way and has took, as, we said, as I said before, has taken somebody to court who has made fun of Erdogan. So are we becoming more like them? Maybe it's Turkey who will set the standards for NATO, which shows, again, how it brings into the question, is it really a useful alliance anymore? Are we kowtowing here in the United States to them? Certainly Obama is kowtowing to the Iranians, and in the Middle East, when they see weakness and they see that people cave, they push for more. They pounce. And, the, and, and, and how is the rest of the world even looking at this? In the last week or so, the Russians have come up and, and buzzed uh, American ships uh, in the Baltic Sea. They, uh, they're doing the, the, the Iranians are doing the same to American ships in the Persian Gulf. And what is our response? Well, the Secretary of State said, we would have had the right to do something, but we didn't do it. In other words, we are weak. We do not have the will to do what is necessary to uh, maintain order. And when people all over the world see American weakness, they get scared. And that is why the entire world, not just the Middle East, is in such disarray right now. The world desperately needs American leadership. We're the only ones. We may be reluctantly. We don't want to be those leaders, but that's the rule of things. It's like a parent with a bunch of teenagers at home, and the parent says, I can't take this. I'm leaving. What is left is utter chaos. That's where we are. That's where we're headed. It's now Turkey that seems is setting the rules for NATO, not NATO for Turkey. Uh, well, look, I'm, again, I'm not an expert on natural gas, but I think the Israelis are under no illusions to the reality of the Turkish regime. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Turks keep saying, and they have their own reasons for doing this, that we're not that far away from an agreement. It's going to be one more session. But Israel is mum on this. Israel doesn't say anything about the negotiations. There are other ways, and I am relying on uh, another really great expert, uh, David Wormser, who also used to work for the American government, um, who's an expert on gas and energy things. There are other ways besides Turkey to get the gas to Europe. One is to Cyprus and then on to Greece, completely bypassing Turkey. Again, I'm beyond my expertise here. So, um, uh, and I would say just one other thing, and it's very important. Just because something is said in the media doesn't mean it's true. Uh, I, 
I'm waiting, and there, maybe there will be a rapprochement between Israel and Turkey. But Turkey is demanding. It's kind of weird, in fact, if you listen to some of the demands. Besides their demands for Gaza, um, the Saudis just went to Egypt, and they went, and they're obviously behind the scenes telling the Israelis that the only way that they're, that Turkey will have a rapprochement with Israel is if Israel gets President Sisi of Egypt to come to Turkey to shake Erdogan's hand. Now, that sounds kind of strange to us, but from a cultural context, in the Middle East, who visits whom? If I visit you, you're the leader. I'm the supplicant. And what Erdogan wants, because there's a huge fight now between Erdogan and President Sisi in Egypt over what uh, they perceive, or what Erdogan perceives, as the leadership of the Muslim world. And that's why he needs Sisi to come to Turkey and shake Erdogan's hand so Erdogan can say, I'm it. I'm the real leader. Well, this is all absurd. This is a question having to do with Israel. What is, can Israel just snap its fingers and, and President Sisi of, of, of Egypt do whatever Israel wants? Of course that's not going to happen. So the whole thing is, frankly, a lot more complicated with a lot more pieces of the puzzle that we simply don't know about. Um, I don't, and again, I could be wrong, but I would doubt there would be a rapprochement between Israel and Turkey in any time in the near future. Good question today. Look, there, Israel's main enemy today is Iran. And uh, there is a Sunni alliance, basically, against Iran. And you could make an argument that it is a tactical, not a strategic allowance. Uh, meaning tactical means it solves today's problems, but in the long term it may do the opposite. And so uh, that may be part of the reason, because Israel is one of the strongest powers on the face of the earth. I know I don't know who your listeners are at the moment, but uh, assuming there's a large group of Jews among them, Jews have this uh, hard – it's hard for Jews to understand that Jews can be powerful. And Israel is one of the most powerful countries on the face of the earth. And it's a great ally against Iran. But is it really on the same page of all the Sunni powers? I just want to say one thing, that when Saddam invaded Kuwait back in 1990, all of a sudden the Saudis and the Kuwaitis here in Washington were the best friend of all the Jewish organizations, Jew this, Jew that. They were, they were on the phone all the time. Until the day that America liberated Kuwait from, took it back from Saddam. From that day on, the, both the Kuwaitis and the Saudis stopped returning the Jews' calls. And the Jews couldn't understand it. The reason I'm telling this is we're in a similar situation today. That, yes, Israel and Saudi Arabia and uh, Turkey and all this and Egypt are all on the same page together against Iran. But if Iran has a new government, and I want to tell you, I personally lived through the Iranian Revolution in a university in northeastern Iran. I watched the uh, how all this worked. Things can turn overnight if they believe there's a foreign will to support people against the government. If that were to happen and all of a sudden Iran would turn to, shall we say, return to sanity. The question then is, would this alliance that Israel has with Turkey, with Saudi Arabia, whatever, would it still be useful? I think in the end that what Israel does have in common with a lot of other peoples in the Middle East is all of us swim in a Sunni sea. It's all of us against the Sunnis. And that's what the Shiites also, they're petrified of the Sunnis. The Shiites are maybe 12% of the whole Muslim world, and they're always afraid of what the Sunnis are going to do to us next. It's sort of like the way the Jews lived in Europe. They tried to be nice to the Europeans because Jews had no power, and the, and the European regimes had all the power. And they hoped that by being nice, that bad things wouldn't happen to them. That's how the Shiites see the Sunnis. What the Shiites and Israel and the Christians and the Alawis in Syria and a few other Yazidis and the Kurds all have in common is we all swim 
in a Sunni sea. What is a Sunni sea? Well, most of the Kurds, however, are uh, Sunni. But Sunnis, again, the view is, I'm right, you're wrong, and as Bernard Lewis says, I'm right, you're wrong, go to hell. And the, the, the Kurds, the Arabs, and the Iranians have been doing their best to try to de if you could say, make Kurds into Arabs, Turks, or Persians, or Iranians. And the Kurds don't like it. And that's why they have such an interesting, a good alliance with the Israelis. Now, I would even say, going back to the naivete, and that's a polite word for the American government in this part of the world, once when President Barzani of the Kurdish, uh, Kurdistan Regional Government of Northern Iraq came to see President Obama. Uh, at one of the meetings, one of the senior uh, State Department people tells the Kurds, stop seeing yourself as Kurds. See yourself as Iraqis. Now, I know this because the Kurdish leaders told me. I mean, it's like how, how much more stupid or naive could you be now, I know those are strong words to say stupid. It's willful ignorance. That's the problem. And uh, so, look, we'll see in the long run where all these alliances go. I simply don't know. I think the, the alliances with the Sunnis are pretty temporary. Let me see. Okay, let me, I'll, I'll try to address this again one by one. Um, uh, do... The signed agreement. A signed agreement in the Middle East means nothing, zero. Um, that's important to us. And so, if we have an agreement or not, I don't know. Uh, I, I've heard various things on that. The question is, does it matter? Um, does um, Does Obama, do Obama and Kerry know this? Well, they should have. Um, if they're so experienced in international diplomacy, or in this part of the world, they should know it. Now, if they didn't know it before, judging by everything they would have seen since they came up with whatever they came up with in this agreement, and the Iranians keep pushing harder and harder and violating it over and over. Now, by now, they should know that Iran doesn't keep agreements. But what are we doing? We are putting our head in the sand like an ostrich, and it's either willfully or unwillfully, I don't know which, choosing to ignore the realities on the ground there. So, um, uh, uh, no. Let me try to address Erdogan and, um, and uh, the Ayatollahs. It's, a, it's an interesting story. The Ayatollahs, an Ayatollah is the senior leadership of the Shiites. Erdogan is a Sunni. The curses in Turkish, when you want to say someone is not reliable, are anti-Shiite. They hate each other. Now, does that mean they may not work together at times? They sure would for making money and a few other things. Erdogan has recently said there's no difference between Sunnis and Shiites. The reason I am sure he said that is that I don't want to be the head of the Sunni world. I want to be the head of the entire Muslim world. But... I, I'm trying to think of an appropriate an example, uh, and uh, uh, the, and only a religious one comes to mind. And I hope I don't defend anybody. Judaism has a wide way. There are various views of of Judaism, of looking at Judaism in the world. But one thing which is outside Judaism is acceptance of Jesus as the Messiah, and that is the equivalent of what Erdogan is doing by saying all Muslims are one. Shiites and Sunnis have been fighting since the death of their prophet Muhammad. He died 1400, about 1,400 years ago, and they have been fighting since then as who is to head Islam. And I earlier said that bygones are never bygones. And so fights that took place way back when, since they can never be resolved, are still being fought today. When Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Revolution, came back to Iran, the first thing that he said when he got off onto the tarmac in, in Tehran, he didn't talk about America, he didn't talk about Israel, he didn't talk about the Shah. He said, I've come to rectify a wrong which took place 1,400 years ago. Everybody understood him, Sunnis and Shiites alike. What is, the wrong, what is, the, what is that wrong? 
and that is that in the fight between what became the Sunnis and the Shiites, the Shiites, which is the family of the Prophet, lost, and the Meccan aristocracy won. That was the fight that took place 1,400 years ago. Is who was to inherit the mantle of Islam? Who's going to inherit the leadership? The family lost. They're the Shiites of today. The Meccan aristocracy won. That battle, we say, oh, Americans, we have this phrase, oh, that's history. Something that happened last week doesn't matter today. But in the Middle East, since no one ever forgets anything, and no one can ever put anything behind them, what happened 1,400 years ago is still relevant today. That's why Khomeini said what he did when he came off the plane in 1979 in, when he landed in Iran. He's resuming that battle. And today, uh, uh, the only reason that Erdogan could possibly be saying this is that it's all of us Muslims need to work together to make sure that the world is eventually ruled entirely by Sharia, by the Muslim holy law. By the way, they don't even agree what that is because the Shiite and Sunni holy laws are completely different, again, from the time of the death of their prophet Muhammad. No, in no way. Um, if I'm correct, I read in an in interview, it was translated from Kurdish. I don't know Kurdish. Uh, where President Barzani of Turkey basically says that Erdogan is working with ISIS. He sent ISIS in to make trouble for the Barzanis in northern Iraq. Um, at the very least, whether that is true or not, the American government knows that the secret, the, uh, the uh, meat, it's the CIA of Turkey, has looked the other way as ISIS people go in and out of Syria and Iraq via Turkey. Not only that, uh, the oil coming out from ISIS areas comes to Turkey, and from what we can figure out, it's Erdogan's son and daughter who uh, get a nice cut of, of let's call it ISIS area-controlled oil. So, uh, you know, this unfortunately, it's it's kind of absurd. Um, now, if uh, in, in you remember if, uh, some years ago, in the, when when Obama first became president, he said the international leader that he was closest with and is one of his closest friends was Erdogan in Turkey. Well, Erdogan has made his life difficult and shamed Obama. And the, when uh, when Erdogan was just here a few weeks ago, uh, Obama barely spoke with him. And uh, what he did say in public was uh, not particularly complimentary to Erdogan. Look, it gets worse. The, there's a, the, an American military base, Injerlik, it's CI, so it looks like Inserlik. It's called Injerlik. It's in uh, southeastern uh, or south-central Turkey. It's a NATO base. And uh, not too long ago, the Americans evacuated all of the families, beside, beside Americans, essential people, from that base. Now, the question is why? We're not hearing about this much in the news. But the soldiers that protect the base are the Turkish military, much of which has been infiltrated by Muslim fundamentalists. This is, again, at the direction of Erdogan. So are they really prepared to protect the Americans at the base? Um, Something is radically wrong here. Um, All I would – if I – could wave a magic wand, what I would really like more than anything is the American government wake up and recognize the reality of the Middle East. There are no peace agreements. Nothing is ever over. Muslim territory remains Muslim forever if it is conquered by Islam. Uh, And that's why Israel, there's no, Israel in 637 was conquered by the Muslims. And so it is Muslim territory there's no difference between the what you know what they call the West Bank and Tel Aviv. It's all Muslim territory, and let's take uh, just as, as shall we say a more neutral sounding uh, conflict. So the Muslims ruled Spain from 712 to 1492. That is, if I'm let me do the calculations, about 524 years ago, the Muslims lost Spain. The internet today is filled in Arabic with all sorts of discussions about how 
the Muslims are going to reconquer Spain because it belongs to Islam. Not only that, there are organizations in Spain which talk about they're there to preserve the great Islamic heritage, which it has culturally, in especially southern Spain, the biggest organizations in Cordova. And once those, you know, and, and you can argue with someone wanting to preserve archaeological ruins and, and beautiful, uh, I don't know what, buildings, but what is going on is that once the, the people in, the, in this particular organization they will tell you they're interested in preserving the culture and heritage. Once they're among Muslims, they say exactly what they're there to do. No, we are there to, to we are preparing for the reconquest of Spain to bring it back into the bosom of Islam. That's vis-a-vis -vis Spain. That's the story with Israel. That's the story with Southern Europe. And they were defeated Muslims twice in six third in 1683. At the gates of Vienna was the second time, and interestingly, the date of the defeat was September 11th, and that was that's no coincidence here of why September 11th was chosen by uh, the uh, Saudi bombers to uh, uh, Osama bin Laden's people to do what they did in New York, the Pentagon, and uh, hijacking a few more planes, whatever. Eventually, the whole world is going to be Muslim, but we need to get everything back, all the pieces, Spain, Israel, southern Europe. But you don't do it one at a time. And that's why you want to get all the Muslims to – they now take the plane or the train around Vienna, and they go, they're going all over Europe. And eventually, again, as I said earlier, it's all going to be Muslim. Now I would add one other interesting thing. There's a fascinating debate on the net about – who President Obama is. This is, again, among the Arabs. Um, what do I mean by that? By Islamic law. I'm not talking, I don't, know, I don't know Obama, I don't know what he thinks. But what I do know is that Obama, uh, by Islamic law, is a Muslim because his father was a Muslim. In Islam, if your father is a Muslim, you're a Muslim. And the question then, interestingly debated, it's a modern question, that if a land becomes Muslim, it's conquered by Islam, it's Muslim forever, as I said before. But there's another thing. If it is ruled by a Muslim, is it therefore already under Islamic rule? Islamic rule means it must be ruled by the Sharia, the Muslim holy law. Is that what America should be since the president, by their understanding, is a Muslim. I am not saying again that he is a Muslim. In the Middle East, it doesn't matter what you say you are. It matters what people think you are. And Islamic law makes it very clear. Obama's father was a Muslim. Therefore, Obama is a Muslim. Obama could be the man in the moon. It doesn't matter. It, it matters his father was a Muslim. By Islamic law, he's a Muslim. Question, is America therefore part of the world of Islam? That's what they're debating on the net. Yeah, um, was the election stolen? Look, there's uh, – in the Middle East, you know, we, look, we worship elections. Now, we worry at times whether our elections are uh, – is there some hanky-panky or some bad things that are going on? The reason they have Middle East elections in the Middle East is because we have them here in the West. Middle Eastern society has nothing to do with elections historically. The whole concept of representative government is alien to the Middle East. You want these results? I'll give you these results. You want whatever? I'll find the votes that are necessary. If you remember the name Ahmadinejad, Jod, who was the um, uh, uh, president of Iran for a while, uh, the votes – from what I understand from Iranians who were involved with this, uh, he wasn't winning the first election. But miraculously, the Revolutionary Guards took over the central election headquarters at about 2 in the morning, and by 3.30, miraculously, 7 million votes appeared for Ahmadinejad. And that's the definition of winning. In Turkey, we have no idea who's voted. We do know that um, people voted, and then they took pictures with their cell phones to go outside, and they were paid to show that they voted a certain way. 
and that's what you do. You just you just show the the picture of it, you how you voted, and and that's it. So are there are they elections like free and fair as we as we say so? Well, it's very nice when Westerners come who don't know Turkish, who don't know the culture, and are therefore very easily bamboozled. So the election results are very good. Let me just give you one last thing on elections. The first election, where whatever election is, of when Yasser Arafat run, he got 88 percent, and whatever uh, opponent they put up there to make it look like an election got 12 percent. And afterwards, he said, he's asking people, did it, was 88 percent too high a figure? Should we have had other people? Other people? Should we have changed the numbers to have less voting for me? It's all a sham to make us feel good. It's very sad. Harold, before we close, um, I have one other question, and um, sure. I, I really, this is Sarah again, I, I cannot thank you enough um, sure, for sure. your wisdom um, and <clears throat> your ability to so clearly enunciate the nature of the world that the Middle East is. Really, I just have one question, um, sure. and that is um, we... Um, and Israel and Ahmed um, has we have very close relationships with um, many Kurds, and I know that there um, the Kurds to me have have ar um, arisen as a very valiant force. They defend themselves. They're very very similar to to Israel in that they don't want anybody else to um, to take a bullet in defense of their own um, sovereignty. Um, and they have seemed to be very reliable allies. But I'm very confused in terms of um, the Syrian Kurds, the Turkish Kurds, and the Iraqi Kurds. Is there one Kurdish community? And you mentioned before that they are Sunnis. Does that mean that their interpretation of the truth and of um, commitments and agreement is the same as you would find in other Sunni communities? I must tell you, again, I've, I've been studying this since I'm 14, long, long time. I'm sometimes confused. Most The amount of Kurds that I know who will tell me that we became Muslims because we were forced to. Um, and uh, I've had many Kurds tell me I'm not a Muslim. Now, to say you're not a Muslim, if you are one, is punishable by death in Islam. But they do this. And uh, are, is there one group? Well, this is a problem. The Kurds have in, enormous infighting, and there's a, 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 a proverb in Kurdish that the Kurds have no friends but the mountains, because they're constantly embroiled or entangled with all sorts of things. No, Jews have the same thing. They fight. It's, it's almost always just verbally. But when it comes to survival, they manage a lot of the time, that's why Israel managed to get created, um, the, uh, they managed to somehow work together. I hope the Kurds will learn to do the same. They, uh, in the Middle East, you never say, you, come learn from, from me. What you say is, this is my experience. You may find it interesting. Because if I say, come learn from me, it means I'm better than you. But this is my experience. Experience is out there. It doesn't belong to me. It may help you. It may not. Now, I can tell you that a lot of Kurdish leaders this is um, both in Iraq and in Syria. They uh, uh, themselves are very ask a lot of questions about how Israel did this, how Israel did that, and um, and hopefully they. That's what history is all about. What can we learn from the past, which will help us with the future? Um, uh, the you know. It, <laughs> Whether there'll be, a, is there one Kurdish identity? Again, I think I said earlier in the conversation about something else, to quote Bernard Lewis, I'm right, you're wrong, go to hell. My way is the right way. It's my way or the highway. And the Kurds have a problem with that. So where it will go in the future, I don't know. Now, there are a small group of Shiite Kurds as well. And my, they're, they're called Thales, the Iraqi ambassador here in Washington, is a Thali Kurd. I mean, she's Shiite. Uh, uh, it's, uh, do they feel, shall we say, 
a sense of Kurdishness. I, my sense is the Shiiteness in most instances is stronger. But that's just my experience. There, are, there is no good research on any of this. And when you ask people in the Middle East a question, do you support this, do you support that, surveys are also, by, by and large, irrelevant because you cannot ask people for their opinions in countries where, or in places where if you say the wrong thing, you may not be alive tomorrow. And when you ask a person for, uh, what he thinks about something, his first reaction is, who are you, what are you going to do with this information, and why should I tell you what I really think? In an odd way, it reminds me of Israeli uh, voters in Israel's last um, uh, parliamentary or Knesset election. Not only did they lie to the pollsters before the election, but they were so afraid of the, the uppity intellectual and um, media self-appointed elite in Israel, which, thank God, is dying. Uh, and when they came out of the ballot box, they basically said they voted the way the polls said before. Now, what did you find out when we got the election results? And I don't know, some hours later, that it wasn't equal. It wasn't neck and neck between Likud and um, and the uh, Labor Alliance. What it was is 30 for Likud and 24 for Labor. What's the point? That the just so so all these surveys, even in a free and democratic a country like Israel, are meaningless. People were afraid in Israel. The next morning, I was in Israel during this last election. People were out, were out in the streets, we did it, we did it! But they were afraid to say anything before because they were made to feel humiliated if they didn't support the labor alliance because the newspapers, by and large, the media, they're all leftist in Israel. Not all, but overwhelmingly so. But it isn't where the people is. And in the Middle East, in general, in other places, which, again, there's no other democracy besides Israel in the entire Middle East, in those other places, then people aren't going to say what they think. All they care about is surviving to the next day. Now, bringing this back to the Kurds, I would only hope that eventually they find a way to work together. I can tell you that a lot of the Kurdish journalists have begged me to help them get an interview with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Now, I, uh, I would say I, my response is, if you want me to help, I need all of you Kurdish journalists to participate together in one interview, because it would, the goal of this it's not partisan. It's to talk about Kurds. It's not that I support this Kurdish group over the other. And I want to tell you from personal experience, the moment that I mentioned that means you and you and you, because I know the Turkish journalist, the Kurdish journalist in this town, the moment you say you need to be all together and you all have one joint interview, I don't know if I could arrange it, but I could certainly find a way to, to bring it up. The first thing they tell me is, oh, no, this couldn't be. Why? You know, it's like I'm, I'm right and he's wrong. And I'm, my response is, well, then, the, then don't expect me to help you. And if I were the Israeli prime minister, I wouldn't take an interview with only you versus only him or something like that, because I don't. I'm interested in Kurdistan. I'm not interested in internal Kurdish politics. That's something for you to work out. And when you work it out, then let's work together. And um, I get. You know, it, it never goes anywhere. They spend all their time in internal bickering. That's the problem the Kurds face. And that's why, while I passionately hope that uh, there is an independent Kurdistan, I think the Kurds are also on this their own worst enemy. I'll tell you, I'm interviewed a lot in Kurdish media. And I always end my uh, uh, the interviews in Kurdish, with one phrase, long live a free and independent Kurdistan, which just makes them feel great. But I use this with whatever journalist, whatever Kurdish journalist wants to interview me. If they would be more concerned about Kurdistan than their internal Kurdish politics, they might be able to make this work sooner rather than later.